we know that the most consistent thing we have is God. Amen. He is always there. So when we're feeling fearful, when we're feeling anxiety, Lord, like we're just asking you, Lord, right now to give us that peace, Father. Just bring it all to peace. Because even the darkness trembles. Amen. In Jesus' name, let's sing this song and just lift up, lift up his name this morning. Me to still live. 
this with this time. Let's look to the Lord. Come to the merciful Father. You give every good and perfect gift, Lord. We just humbly bow before you and just thank you for your love, grace, and mercy, Father. Right now, Father God, I ask you, Father God, to hide me behind your cross, Father God. I come before you as an empty vessel to a full fountain, asking you to fill me up, Father God, from the head to my feet, Father God. I pray, Father God, that you just have your way with this message and with your people. We thank you, we love you, we praise you. That's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So today I'll be coming to you from John, uh, verse chapter eighteen, verses one through eleven. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John, chapter eighteen, verses one through eleven, and stand once you have it in honor of God's word. And this is what the word of God says. Having spoken these words, Jesus went out with his disciples over the stream Kidron, where there was a garden. He and his disciples entered into it. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew of the place. Mm -hmm. For Jesus oftentimes went there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received the band of officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all things were coming upon him, went out and said to them, Whom do you seek? Mm. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. And then as soon as he had said to them, I am, they went backwards and fell to the ground. Yes, Lord. Then he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered and said, I told you that I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go away, that the word might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom he was giving to me. I have lost, excuse me, I have lost not one of them. Then Simon Peter, having the sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear, and the servant's name was Malchus. Then Jesus said to Peter, put up your sword into his sheath. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers and hearers of his holy word. You may be seated. Amen. And so, here's the funny thing. All week long, I had another message that I wanted to preach. <laughs> I studied it and prepared it and was doing like I do. Because all week long, I just started writing notes. You know, stuff. If you go to my house or you get in my car, you find little slips of paper. where when something comes to me, I just write it down. And because the Lord just works with me that way, and then I, on a Saturday night, I put all that stuff together like I'm doing my taxes and get it all laid out in one kind of orderly fashion. But this week, it just would not work. And so I, I began to be frustrated, like, Lord, I know this is a good word, and I know you want your people to know about this, but why won't it work? And then maybe about Wednesday, I just said, okay, I give. This must be something that you want me to have. And so... I started to read through John 18. And then last night as I was outside, or maybe about 6 o'clock, I was outside shoveling. And then the Lord kind of helped me understand why he wanted me in this text. Mm -hmm. Because I'm out there and I'm shoveling and I'm thinking and meditating. And he said, why do you preach? I said, so that souls can be saved. Why else do you preach? The wind the lost. Why else do you preach? He, and he reminded me, we don't just preach to those people that come into church that don't know the Lord. Because we want those souls to be saved. We want to water. We want the Lord to, to add an increase. But we also preach to the backslider, that person who was in church, and, and, and maybe they've gone away, but we want, like the prodigal son, for them to come running back. But you know, sometimes the message isn't for the, the people who don't know the Lord. Sometimes the people who know the Lord need to be reminded of the goodness of the Lord. Yeah, and he reminded me that sometimes people need to be reminded, educated, and encouraged. And so my prayer this morning is that that's what happens with this message. Amen. Is that you leave here educated, reminded, 
and encouraged because it seems like with everything that's going on, I don't even want to say that name anymore. I think I've said that, that, that mess so many times. We're talking to people in the supermarket and talking to people in the hospital and talking to people on the phone. I'm tired of saying that name. Amen. You know, I had somebody tell me one time, you know, Pastor, I don't like it when people say the name of Satan in church. I said, I, I get that, but, you know, we have to stomp on Satan's head in Jesus' name. And so I'm not going to worry about saying his name in here, but I'm tired of saying that virus's name. Because I, I, I just feel that it's it's... Some things that are going on that are beyond our pay grade, and we're worried about things that we can't handle. We need to take it to the source who can handle all of our problems. <laughs> and so we just want to trust God. But I Amen. pray that this message today helps you understand some things. Amen. And so as we look into our text, we see that it says, after these things, and what things are we talking about? Jesus has just prayed that high priestly prayer in John 17. He's defeated any doubt that could have possibly rose up in him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And now he stands ready to face the cross. So he and his disciples go to that place that they often went. And it says that it's a place that even Judas knew. So they go there. And it's interesting to me that someone could possibly try and say, well, Jesus was, Judas had to find Jesus. Jesus went to a place that was commonly known. And I'm not going to talk about it much, but I've had friends that have been avoiding the authorities. We'll just put it like that. <laughs> and when they were avoiding the authorities for whatever reason, they didn't go to places people commonly went. They, they didn't hang out at their houses. They didn't go to their girlfriend's home. They didn't hang out in public places. They, they went to, to back alley places. They, they, they went through the dark times to, to get the dark places to get to where they needed to go. They drove their cars late at night. They didn't go out someplace where everybody knew. And so Jesus is not hiding. He he's already understands exactly what must happen to him. And he knows what's going to happen. So he goes to this place, and the thing isn't that Judas knows where Jesus is. The situation is Jesus knows where Judas is going to look. Amen. See, you know, we don't need to give Judas credit for doing something that God has got orchestrated all along. Right. You see, everything that was going to happen to Jesus, Jesus knew about it. So Jesus went ready to go. Amen. His life was prepared for this hour. Verse 4 clearly says that Jesus knew all things. Amen. He knew it was going to happen. But we get it confused sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if we simply look at the text, Judas didn't know where Jesus was. He was hoping that Jesus was there. Because if I'm understanding it correctly, when during this Passover season, around this time, there's a full moon. And that full moon lights up the entire city. You don't need torches and lanterns and weapons to find somebody. <laughs> What they did, they came with torches and lanterns because they thought they were going to have to go into caves and, and, and back into tree groves and to try and find Jesus. But Jesus is right there waiting. Amen. So he's not hiding. He knows what's going on. And saints, I want you to know that we serve a God Amen. who knows all things. Yes. And so I want you to remember that start coming at you, when things start getting rough, Jesus knows what's going on in your life. He, he wasn't surprised by Judas showing up with over 600 men. He wasn't surprised by, by that betrayal of Judas. He, was, he wasn't even surprised when Peter pulls the sword. He's not surprised. Mm -hmm. There's this thing that's going on in the country and we're saying we're not prepared because we didn't do this and we didn't do that. Jesus knew what was going to happen long before it happened. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, is who are you going to rely on? Are you going to rely on the government? Are you going to rely on your friends and your family? Are you going to trust in the one who knew tomorrow before yesterday? Yeah. Are you going to trust in the only wise God? He knows what comes next. Yeah. Amen. He knows. He's not surprised. And so why should we sit and worry about something that he has well in hand? Yeah. Sometimes people will say, you know, if, if God is so good, where, where is he in all this? What I want you to remember to say to him, he's where he was yesterday. Amen. 
Amen. He's where he will be tomorrow. He's where he will be when all this is wrapped up and said and done. He is still in control, yes. sitting on the throne. My Bible tells me. Isaiah 41 and 10 says, So we do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. Yes. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Luke 12 says, do not worry about your life or what you will eat or about your body or what you will wear. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow nor reap. They do not store food or barns. Yes. Yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than the birds. Yeah. He's got you. Psalm 27 and 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Yeah. Whom shall I fear? Yeah. The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Yeah. There is no time for Christians to fear. This is the time for us to be what God has called us to be. We, we, we need to understand that we plug into a power source that isn't controlled by gas, light, and electric. We have a power source that it, it is never ending. The Holy Spirit down yeah. deep inside of us. Yeah. And when things begin to get bleak and when things begin to get scary and, and, and things begin to darken, we are the light that needs to shine through. We need to understand who Jesus is. Yeah. But Jesus is not only all knowing, you need to be educated that Jesus is all powerful. Yeah. Yeah. You see, so Jesus, knowing that they're looking for him, as I'm playing this out in my mind, I can just imagine Jesus having a little bit of swagger. And so as this, now picture this scene. This isn't 20, 30, or 40 people. They, they said that this was possibly a tenth of a legion. And so this could be up to 400 to 600 men coming to Jesus at one time. Now, I, I can imagine Jesus as they're standing there, and Judas is in front of him, and they're standing there. He knows they're looking for him. And so Jesus, whom do you seek? We seek Jesus of Nazareth. And then he says those two words, I am. Amen. He says that I am. And when he says those words, they, they, they can't even stand on their feet. He knocks them back with the sheer power that radiates from him. I am. Yeah. The same words that he told Moses when Moses said, who, who shall I say sent me? I am that I am. Yeah. The, the, the great I am. When we think about that I am, Jesus is putting himself as the one and only God. He's making himself in allegiance with God. He's making himself God. So people would say, well, no, Jesus never said he is God. When he said that right there, anybody who understood scripture knew that he was saying that I am God. Amen. The eternal God. Mm -hmm. The great I am. I, I think about some of those I am statements that, uh, that are in the Bible that Jesus said. He said, I am the bread of life. When you are hungry and you are in need, he's there to satisfy. When, when, when he said that I am the good shepherd, he's willing to lay down his life for us. When he said I am the light of the world, he's willing to give us darkness and chase. He's willing to shine the light into the darkness and chase it away. I am the door that you can come through. I am the way, the truth, and life. All that you need is wrapped up in me. When he says, I am, what do you need? Do, do you need salvation? I'm the way. Do, do, you, do you need strength for the day? I, I can be that for you. I can be help. I can be healing. I can be joy. I can be strength. What do you need? I can be that. Are you sick? I'm in great position. Are, are, are you cursed? He's got it all. I could go on and on and on and on about all that we have wrapped up in Jesus because he's the all-sufficient God. Amen. But he said these words and these men fell backwards. The power of Jesus. That's power. Now just imagine the thing I want to encourage you with is that's the same Jesus that's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Yes. Which is simply two words from his lips, I am, and 600 men fall backwards. 
on the ground. Mm. He's the same God who can speak to the storm and say, be still. He's the same God that can speak to the storms in your life. Amen. Maybe your husband's not right. Maybe your wife isn't right. Maybe your kids aren't right. Maybe just the world just seems like it's going all crazy right now and you don't know where to turn and what to do. You can just simply go to the great I am. Yes. And you can hear him say those words, peace be still. Do you trust him? Amen. He's got the power. Yes, I think of one of the things Deacon Real Man said the other day when he was preaching. He said, at the name of Jesus, demons tremble. Mm -hmm. I think of the song when they and the praise singer singer said the darkness trembles when Jesus just simply walks in. The light of the world comes in and, and things just have to change. Yes. Yes. The question I have for you is, are you taking Jesus into all this turmoil? Mm -hmm. Are you taking Jesus with you when you walk into the supermarket? Are you taking Jesus with you when you go to your job? Are you taking Jesus with you when you're talking to these people and they seem like they just are completely out of control? Mm. Don't sit there and try and rationalize with somebody who doesn't have a rational mind. Amen. Because if you, if, if you want to be 100% honest, having people buy all the toilet paper in Walmart and then you ask them why they bought it and they say, well, the person next to me bought it. That is not a rational mind. It isn't. Now, I'll be honest with you, I got a few rolls. But I didn't get it because I was panicking because I, don't, I thought the world was in it. I was going to wrap myself in toilet paper and hide in the basement. Maybe that's what they're going to do. I got it because we need toilet paper. So, but I'm prepared. But don't take trying to rationalize with somebody who doesn't have a rational mind. You take Jesus in that situation. And when things start to spin and things start to go out of control, you start to pray. Mm -hmm. You don't have to even try to interject anything into the conversation. You just sit there, fold your hands, and pray. Amen. Let that power that is within you, let the Holy Spirit begin to rise in you. And he'll let you see what you need to see in that room. He'll give you words to say in that room. Let God be God. That power. Over 600 men mm. knocked down with just the word. Now, now, can you imagine Jesus? Now, Jesus has got some swagger. He, 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 he's got it. He, he's, he walks up to him and he knows what's about to happen and he says, I am. Mm -hmm. Now, he's got 11 more friends with him. They don't got the same kind of swagger. <laughs> Now they trust Jesus, but they're looking out at these numbers. Now can you imagine? You 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 bad when it's eleven of y'all and it's eleven of them, and like we got this. But then you look up and there's six hundred mm. soldiers. Not just regular everyday people, but these are six hundred trained armed soldiers. And I'm imagining in the disciples' minds, they were thinking, you know, he's he walked on water, he's done all this stuff, and he's disappeared. Hopefully he takes us with us this time. <laughs> Maybe they were thinking that this was it. Maybe they were thinking that they were outnumbered. Maybe they were thinking that, that, that Jesus had, had was overmatched. Here's the thing that I want you to know. Jesus is never outnumbered. Amen. He's never outmatched. Yeah, amen. He, he's never at a disadvantage. Amen. What he says will come to pass and he's able to do That's all right. things. Right. My God is able to do far more than I could ever think or imagine. Amen. That's the God that we serve. Amen. And so now, as they dust themselves off and they, they stand up to their, stand to their feet and they come back and Jesus said again, now who are you looking for? <laughs> and I'm imagining all the base is out of their voice. Now they're coming and they're saying Jesus of Nazareth with just a little bit more respect. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not saying it as if they're going to take him. Now they're just saying it, Lord, as if you would just simply come with us. <laughs> and Jesus again said, I am he. I'm the one you're looking for. But what you need to do is you need to let these go. Something I want you to remember is that this all-knowing all-powerful God was concerned about the people that followed him. He didn't just say, well, I'm good and you just do what you want to do with it. He was there to protect them. That's one of the things that gives me comfort so many times. 
And if you've ever talked to me about it, I think I say it all the time. I trust in the fact that God knows all of everything. Amen. I know the fact that God is all powerful. And I know the fact that he loves me more than anybody else ever has or ever will. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got somebody who knows every situation that's going to come upon you and is able to handle any situation that's ever going to come at you, and he loves you more than anybody else, what is there to fear? Right. You think a newborn baby and his mother's arm is ever afraid of the dark or the, or, or the world around it? They know because that mother would give their life for that child. And Jesus has already proven that he loves you more than life itself by going to the cross for you. He loves you. And so don't be afraid. There's no need to worry. There's no need to doubt. Because here's the thing. If. By some stretch, you were one of those people that get this cursed thing. Who's to say God won't use that thing to change your life? Amen. Who's to say that God won't use you to change someone and draw them to Christ? Amen. How many people go to a hospital bed and they've got cancer or, or some type of illness and some type of situation in their body and they're dealing with an atheist doctor or they're dealing with an unbelieving nurse and as they're coming in there and they're ministering and they're talking and they're doing all this stuff with the medicine and they begin to notice that the person is getting getting better and better but they don't know what medicine is making them better and, and, and then they begin to say, well, I don't know what it is or how can they get there and, I, and then before you can even explain it to them, you can just... Help him to see it's Jesus. Amen. It's Jesus. Hmm. I remember a situation, and, I, and, and, and it is always vivid in my mind, is one day my wife came home, and she was praying. And she was praying because she had someone in her family that she loved, and the doctor had said, we can't do nothing else. We, 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 we've given up. We're, we're just going to kind of, you know, maybe just do some things to make her comfortable. And I remember, because we had Jermichael and Jakari, and she said, I just need to pray. I just need to pray. And so she said, can you just take the boys so I can just pray? And so I took the boys, and she was in that bedroom for four or five hours on her face, crying out to God. And she went to the hospital the next day. The doctors haven't changed. The nurses haven't changed. The medication hasn't changed. But the situation has changed. Yes. You see, because what the doctor said they couldn't do, God could do. Yes. And so your road may be bumpy, but God is still the one driving the car. And if he has your destination, then you should just sit back and enjoy the ride because he's going to get you where you need to go. But sometimes we're like Peter. Jesus got this situation in control. He's got it. But while Jesus is saying what he's saying and the people are getting ready, Peter goes up under his jacket and he pulls out a shank. And so, why did Peter do that? Well, this is what he did. Depending on your view, he was either afraid or he was trying to defend Jesus. And so most of the time, I don't know if Peter was right-handed or left-handed, but most time people right-handed, when you pull a sword or a weapon, you come from this side, you're, you're going to be striking this way. And if he was facing the person, he would have struck him on the left side. But they say Peter got him on the right side. So that meant he probably pulled it out while the guy was going the opposite direction. So I don't know how brave that was. I don't know if it was a mistake. I don't know if he was trying to get him or he was just pulling us out and he got him by, on the air by accident. But regardless of what the situation is, we don't need to fight God's battles. Amen. Peter was operating in a place where he was thinking he knew better how to defend Jesus than Jesus knew how to defend himself. Wow. You see, because Jesus was not worried about defending himself. He's already made up his mind. 
He's going to the cross. He's going to die for our sins. He's going to fulfill the will of the Father. And Peter's trying to come against that. And since the thing we have to do is we can't operate in the spirit of fear. Because when we operate in the spirit of fear, we're going against the will of God. Amen. God did not give you a spirit of fear. Amen. He doesn't want you walking around afraid and downhearted. But Peter was in this place and he's not thinking clearly. And so he's leaning on his understanding instead of trusting the Lord. But what does the Bible tell us? Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lean not on your own understanding. Because your understanding is as great as you may think it is, it can be sometimes flawed. Mm -hmm. It can be sometimes selfish. Amen. Maybe Peter did all this because Peter was prayerless. You see, earlier in the evening, Jesus had told Peter and, and a couple of the other disciples said, come and pray with me. But instead of praying, Peter took a nap. And so now when, when everything is happening, he, he doesn't have that prayer life to fall back on. The only thing he has to fall back on is his natural man. Right. Hmm. I teach a class over at the hospital with Camille, and one of the things we talk about is that everybody has this thing called fight or flight. When a situation happens, you're going to do one of three things. You're going to strike out in fear, you're going to run or you're going to freeze. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, operating in you, moving and guiding you, you're going to rely on your flesh. And your flesh is never going to fulfill the righteousness of God. Amen. You, you, you can't do it. You have to just give it to God and let God do what God's going to do. Amen. You need to take time to pray. That's one of the reasons why I want us to do this, this, this praying at 12 o'clock for 40 days is because it says it takes 30 days to develop a habit. I want it to be a habit with you. And, and, and you may say, well, that, that's not a good word for us to pray. Whatever it takes to get you to pray is what I'm willing to do. Amen. If that means i got to call you every day at 12 o'clock and say, hey, it's your turn to pray, then guess what? Send me your phone number. I will call you at 12 o'clock and let you know it's time to pray. I want you to have an attitude or a mindset that prayer is so vitally important. Amen. There's that old saying, little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. Much prayer, much power. Amen. Because when you can trust in the God of the universe, when you can get that direct line to him, you can operate in a manner that the, the, the world doesn't understand. You can walk in a situation where everything looks dark because you've got a direct line with the Savior. Spend some time praying with him. But Jesus not only shows us that he's got the situation in control, but he shows us his compassion. I can't imagine being in a situation where you've got 600 people coming against you and your partner says, I got one. You know, he did his part. He, you know, he got the one guy. You take the other 599, Jesus. I got this one. But Jesus reached out and he heals the man. Mm. What kind of compassion is that? Mm. That's the same Jesus we have today. And so when all this is going on, don't worry. Don't worry. You can rejoice. Because it wasn't your ear that Jesus healed. It was your soul. Amen. He did far more for you than he ever did for Malchus. Mm. And so when somebody asks you a question, where is God in all this? Where is God when people are getting sick and, and, and people are having heart or, 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 or hurt and their heartache and pain is going on? Where is God? Remind them. Encourage them. Educate them. That he's right where he was in the beginning and where he'll be at the end. Amen. Still sitting on the throne, still in control. The cross couldn't keep him down. The grave couldn't hold him. He reigns and he rules forever. Amen. Amen.
We know, Father God, that we're few in number today, Father God, but we know that you are still mighty, Lord. We know, Father God, that you can take two or three people and you can do a wondrous thing, Father God. So we yes, pray, Lord, that you begin to uh, operate and move in the people in this nation, in this city, in this church, Father God, and help them that are afraid, Father God, to, to, to have that fear cast out, Father God. It says the perfect love cast out fear, Father God, and, and when they have you, Father God, they can have perfect love, Father Lord. I, I pray, Father God, for those that are actually feeling ill today, Father God, that you just begin to heal and move their bodies, Father God. I pray, Father God, that you sweep through the hospital, Father God, and you just touch those that are in those beds, touch the doctors, touch the nurses, Father God, touch the entire staff, Lord. I pray that you be with them, Lord. I ask you to just help us to be uh, reflections of your light in this world. When the opportunity rises, Father God, that we don't speak fear or doubt, that we speak victory and joy, Lord, put your word in our mouth, Father God. Put a song in our heart. Put a spring in our step, Father God, and encourage to do the things that you call us to do. And so we thank you, we love you, and we praise you. And it's in your son, Jesus the Christ, that we pray. Amen. Amen. And I believe we're all family, but I still extend the invitation. If there's somebody here today who doesn't know Jesus and the pardon of their sins, and they want to know Jesus, the doors of the church are open. Or well, maybe you're here today and you want to come back home. Anybody need to pray the prayer of rededication? Or well, maybe you're just here today and you just need somebody to pray with you. Maybe your money's not right, maybe the relationship's not right, maybe your kids aren't right, maybe you're not right. And you just need somebody to stand in agreement with you. The Bible says when two or three are gathered, they are mine in the midst. And so take this opportunity to lay your burdens at the cross. Don't take them home with you. Take them here and take them to the altar and leave them there. The prayer team is assembled. If you want prayer, come on down.
We ask you, Father God, to uh, hold the force to this week, help us to be slow to anger and quick to forgive, and always ready to account for who you are. And may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. We thank you, Lord, for all these things. In your son Jesus' name, go in peace, and may the God of peace go with you. Have a blessed day.